Time having arrived, I call this meeting of the Brockton School Committee to order. Ask you to please rise and join me for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. I ask everyone, could you please remain standing for just a moment, please? I'd ask everybody uh, for a moment of silence. Uh, we were informed today that um, one of our administrative assistants, Lisa Ando, her son Anthony passed away. Anthony was a young man, I believe under 30 years old. He did have a lifelong illness, but it was uh, um, certainly surprising. So please keep him uh, and Lisa in your prayers. Thank you. We will open the meeting with uh, hearing of visitors, and uh, we have one visitor signed in with us this evening, Janet Landerholm. Janet would like to come down and join us. I really have more papers than anything. Uh, good evening, Mayor, Superintendent, <coughs> members of the school committee. I would like to start tonight by thanking you for restoring one of our positions. The position that was restored was a secretary in our teaching and learning department. Um, and I'm not quite sure what the priority is as far as bringing positions back. But we have quite a few departments that are in need of more. We have four departments at Central, SPED, Payroll, Accounts Payable, Community Schools, and one at the High School Guidance Department. Those five departments really need their administrative assistance back. So that being said, I would appreciate it if you would please give us some type of consideration as to bringing back more. I do appreciate the one that you gave us. I know we don't have too many left in our union that are laid off, but I would appreciate if you could uh, give us the consideration of bringing back some more. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> okay, our next piece of business is the consent agenda. The consent agenda is the manner in which the school committee is able to act upon an entire block of uh, relatively routine matters in order to uh, keep the meeting moving along. However, if uh, any individual member of the committee would like to have any agenda item from the consent agenda removed for individual uh, discussion, we can do that at this time. So is there anyone that would like an agenda item removed? Mrs. Sullivan. Letter I. The letter I, okay. Anyone else? Okay, motion on the table. Can we have a second? Second. Motion made and properly seconded to approve all consent agenda items except I. All in favor? Approved unanimously. Ms. Sullivan, letter I. It's all okay. yours. Okay, on letter I, I just wanted to point out that um, we have a donation. Uh, Michael Fish of Delbrook Construction purchased and donated to Kelly Haggerty, kindergarten teacher at the Raymond School through DonorChoose.org, a touchscreen smart board, and also an Epson uh, projector, okay? This equipment will be needed to be installed by our IT department. Okay, I just wanted to point out that Kelly, I know this year, she, I know Kelly, and I know she's been at the Raymond School, and she had to move this year to the David, no, She's been at the Davis yes. and had to move to the Raymond because of our budget cuts, our budget deficit this year. And I know she's the kind of teacher, which is like a lot of our teachers, that when she gets into a classroom, she has kindergarten this year, she's had first grade right on, the, you know, probably like five years in a row at the um, Davis. And she goes right out and gets these type donations wherever she is every year. So I just wanted to recognize her our teachers are very savvy, and when you mentioned the DonorChoose.org, uh, many of them have, have access, accessed that website, put in things that they need for their classes. 
um, and this has been very, very helpful. It has been successful throughout the district. Um, I thank our IT department who does support and make sure this is a Promethean board, uh, very much, especially when we talk about kindergarten students, instrumental for instruction, et cetera. So thank you to Kelly Haggerty, a kindergarten teacher, and certainly to all our teachers and staff members that understand the deficit and make sure that they are out there looking at opportunities. And you'll hear some others uh, actually this evening. So thank you. All right. So do we have a motion? Motion to accept the donation to the Raymond School Projector and Smart Board. OK. Second, Ms. Plant. All in favor? Approved. Thank you very much. Mayor, can I also mention, I didn't, uh, I don't know if Principal Marcia Andrade Serpa is out there, but under letter E, acceptance of Angelo School Grant Award of Voya Unsung Heroes, $2,000. Marcia and her team also are instrumental in finding what you would consider small grants. And something that happened we think is very interesting, it was, I don't know if you saw it, it was in the newspaper. There was a picture, it talked about, you know, teachers going after the grant. And somebody saw the picture who had been from Brockton, is now part of a hedge fund account, and actually contacted Marcia, wants to remain anonymous, and is sending a check for $10,000 wow. to provide additional science kits on top of that 2000 wow. So again, I want to say that to our, our teachers out there, our staff, when you look at something like 2000 and you might say, well, you know, is that worth the effort? Of course it's worth the effort. But then to see somebody else out there that reads about um, that type of an initiative and contacts the school directly, uh, makes uh, a friend, uh, contacts us, wants to remain anonymous, but is willing to give 10000 in addition to the 2000 That's great. Awesome. Thank you. OK. At uh, this time, Superintendent, I'll turn the meeting over to you for your report on teaching and learning. Thank you, Mayor. I am excited, and I'm sure oh, Marcia just walked in before I continue. So Marcia, I just talked about, would you like to come down for a minute? I'm sorry to do that to you. <laughs> so I just talked about how wonderful you and your staff were uh, in going after numbers of sometimes small grants. Um, so I'll let you explain a little bit about the 2000, and I did tell them the good news. Um, so would you like to tell us a little bit about it? Sure. So we were very excited to for the opportunity for the Voya Unsung Heroes Grant. Uh, we were selected for the $2,000 award that would purchase about two kits for our school. And these are the Museum of Science sponsored elementary or engineering as elementary kits. They are wonderful kits that our teachers are very excited to use because our kids are very excited. They have a beautiful piece of literature attached to each book. These are stories about children that look like our kids. They have engineers in their families. So really a nice, they're able to make a nice connection. They learn about problem solving, the design process, and then at the end, the students are able to use the kit to make, um, to make whatever this specific kit is about. And it's just, we're so excited to be able to offer that to our kids. You know, kids are, children are natural engineers, and for them to see themselves as future engineers, scientists, designers, I think that's so important. So these kits are an opportunity to do that. So $2,000 is what we got, which we were very pleased with. They said that would put us into the next level. We should know by the end of the month, which is fast approaching. Um, then there's a potential for other monies that are associated with that specific grant. The enterprise came to do a little story about our grant, and um, we featured it on Facebook. And a, an anonymous donor wants to donate $10,000 for the purchase of more grants. So who couldn't be pleased with that? I was thrilled. And because that's what our kids need. Um, these are tough times, so we're trying very hard to give our kids the opportunities that they deserve. Level the playing field. That's our, our goal. Thank you. Again, I'm excited. I'm sure you have all noticed we have a new member uh, of our school committee team here. And this is a student representative from Brockton High School, uh, Shama Erase. And Shama is a senior at Brockton High. And I'm going to let her introduce herself, tell us a little bit about what she does. And then she'll give her report about Brockton High this evening. So welcome, Shama. 
Thank you, and uh, like you said, my name is Shama E. Race. I am a senior, finally, at Brockton High School. I'm in the Red Building, and um, I, I'm happy to be here to talk about what's gonna, what has happened at um, our school so far. And um, just before I start, I wanted to thank Dr. Murray for giving me the opportunity to talk about this great school. Um, so for back to school, it, um, it was a very long summer, and so it was kind of difficult to get back into the groove of things. But um, by this time, I think everyone, including the new freshmen and the new coming students, are pretty well settled and ready to have a great year. Um, and speaking of the freshmen, the first few days of school, freshman mentors, the um, people in the orange shirts, were around all over the school to help newcomers find their classes. Um, I know during the training a lot of people said that they remembered how it was to be a lost freshman in this huge school, so um, we really appreciated going back and, and helping the new people. Um, and recently sports have been back, mainly the football team, and um, I know that it's a, a very well celebrated team and especially us as seniors definitely showed our pride on Friday and uh, it was a very fun game and we won yay go boxers um, now that was against yes. which team was that Way well, Weymouth. <laughs> Weymouth. yes uh, and I know the band and the cheerleaders came around to every um, calf and for all the lunches to cheer on the, the team. And extracurriculars have started again, like clubs and things like student councils. S student council, we've already started planning projects that we want to complete this year. And um, more, more clubs are opening up as the weeks go by. And my last point would be Dr. Murray again. And um, I just wanted to say that he introduced himself in a very like nice way. He met with every grade in an assembly um, towards the beginning of the school week. And um, he walked around the school and introduced himself to us. And I know the first time I met him, he said that he'd get lost the first couple days. But so <laughs> far, every time I see him in the hallways, he looks like he's doing pretty well. So. That's just, good. just have those kids with the orange shirts ready to <laughs> yeah. push them around. That's why so many. <laughs> yes, and um, yes, and he answered questions at the assembly, which I thought was very. Um, it added a very good personal touch to it, and uh, I just wanted to say that I'm very excited to be here and talk about Brockton High because I really do love it. And uh, thank you for listening and inviting me to be part of your committee. And I guess we're going to see each other for the whole year. So we are. I'll talk so, to you do guys we give soon. you the meeting schedule? Yes. <laughs> well, That's we're, very, we're very happy to have you on board. Now, you. Have you, you're looking at colleges, I would guess. Yes. Lots what are you of looking colleges. to major in? I'm looking to major in accounting and do the pre med tract so I could go to medical school after college. Pre med, very good. Well, we're proud to have you here. Thank you. Always adds a, another dimension to our school committee. Um, I know we have uh, an award that we're giving out, but before I do that, I do want to introduce, um, I'm sure you've noticed that Deputy Superintendent Thomas is not here this evening. I haven't necessarily replaced him with Michelle Connors, one of our associate principals, but she is um, in her doctoral program at BC. It is a three-year program. Uh, I am serving uh, as her mentor in the program, so she um, is doing a number of projects, uh, will be working alongside me at different times. You'll see her at different school committee meetings, uh, et cetera, so that she can get you know, some experience. Not that she hasn't been here often. I, I know we see her face often. So congratulations to Michelle for getting accepted into the BC doctoral program. We have numbers of teachers throughout the districts that are in doctoral programs. That makes us very proud. Uh, and again, we will support them in any way we can. It certainly benefits our district. And next I'd like to invite, and I, I want to tell the story. Um, in opening day, you heard me talk about, and little did we realize on opening day when we were looking at uh, Hurricane Harvey uh, in uh, the Houston area. 
and we were watching Irma at the time. And, and obviously, after opening day, Irma hit Florida. You had the earthquake in Mexico. You've had uh, Hurricane uh, Jose. You've got Hurricane you know, Maria. So all of these things that are happening, what we originally did was we ended up with uh, teachers coming forward and wanting to have donations or do, do what we could do to support the relief efforts. So on opening day and throughout the district for that first week, we collected, I want to say, about 25 boxes of items that were packaged. And all of a sudden, we were looking at each other saying, what do we do with these 25 boxes that were filled with all kinds of things? How do we get them down to Houston? So right away, um, we made a connection with our Teamsters, who have been wonderful. And I want to invite uh, Brian uh, McElhaney down here. And I'd like him to tell us a little bit um, about what's happened. But I know he's got a few of the Teamsters here. We've got a couple of our custodians. And we can't thank you enough for coming forward and taking care of those boxes. And I want to thank you always for a wonderful collaboration and always coming to our assistance whenever we need it. Well, thank you, Kathy. Uh, we have uh, also Bill Trask, Ed McPherson from uh, the Teamsters office, and Dan Spillane from the custodians group that we represent. So uh, when we got the call from the uh, superintendent's office, um, it just so happened that we were in the middle of an, uh, a drive ourselves. Uh, we had 48 hours to uh, what we hoped to get two trailers down to Houston from the Teamsters of New England, which turned out to be uh, 11 trailers and uh, two truckloads of construction materials that we got to Houston within 48 hours of the first call that we got. So when we got the call from the school department, we were happy to partner with the school department. They did a great job. Um, and the boys and myself went down to the warehouse and packed everything up and we got it on that last truck out. So all of the goods that were collected here by the school department uh, went into Boston and the Joint Council 10 trucks and local 25 trucks uh, delivered them to uh, Teamsters Local 988 in Houston, Texas, where they were distributed uh, to all the appropriate agencies and uh, they've been doing a great job down there. And uh, now they've moved on to Florida, and they'll probably move on to Puerto Rico as well. But um, we had uh, approximately uh, $10 million worth of goods that we moved down there in a 48-hour period. So it's been a great turnout from all of New England. Um, from your donations, there was also uh, two other schools that dropped donations off at our hall when they heard about that. Uh, so we did move those for them as well. So I think uh, everything worked out great, and the people were very appreciative. If you would like to see... Uh, some of the product being moved uh, on the Local 25 website, teamsyslocal25.com. They have some videos of all of your products being moved and um, going, being distributed in Houston. Uh, if you look closely, you might see some of the notes that your people wrote on the boxes to the people. So uh, it's about a three or four minute video that's on their website. So you can pull that up and check it out and um, you know, see the great job that everybody did and the results of all your hard work. So uh, thank you for calling us. It was an honor to help out. And anytime you guys need help, we'd be happy to step up and help you out. Can you invite your team down here, please? Sure. Can you come join us. So, Mayor, would you like to award? Oh, geez. So I give it to you. We'll get the men my down glasses here. to read it. All right. While they're coming down, uh, this is a special uh, certificate of recognition that we would like to present on behalf of the Brockton Public Schools to uh, Brian McElhaney, the Teamsters Locals 653, 25, and 988 in Houston, Texas. With sincere thanks for your invaluable role in packing, loading, and transporting 25 boxes of donations from the Brockton Public Schools employees to the Hurricane Harvey Relief Program in Houston. We could not have done it without you. And this is presented, uh, Brian, to you on behalf of the Teamsters from both the superintendent and I. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Oh. Thanks again, Brian. Get, 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 get a good photo with everyone looking at it. <laughs> Got it. Good. There we go. Thanks, Thanks a lot. again. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, Danny, thank you. I will let you know that in the schools, uh, and we have a number of things still happening, but um, in light of the fact of the continuing disaster relief efforts, um, we have uh, big water containers, the uh, water jugs, decorated with our yellow ribbons. 
um, also um, you know, the disaster relief efforts. So we are collecting donations. They will be made out to Red Cross Massachusetts. We also have a couple of other things schools are doing individually. I know one of our principals, Colleen Proudler, taught down in the Houston area, is connecting with a school down there uh, to partner with. So we will continue to keep those efforts. If anyone would like to donate, uh, please call the school department office and we'll make sure that, that your check gets to uh, Red Cross Massachusetts. And moving on. So we had opening day of kindergarten 2017. Um, we do have a little video clip to show you. I think it's keyed up to go, is that right? So we were out visiting each of the sites. Um, I would like you to see the um, open house uh, we had at the Barrett Russell. And we're going to start by showing you what it was like earlier in moving all of the things around with our transitioning and also to um, see what was happening uh, with our enrollment throughout the district. I will tell you it was a great day. Kids were very excited. There were some kids in uniforms that couldn't wait to tell me and were very proud that they were wearing uniforms. Uh, there were certainly the youngsters crying and wanting to hang on to the parents. I was always jealous as a parent because my kids waved and said goodbye and left. And I used to feel like I wanted to be one of those parents. But watching the, uh, having been an adjustment counselor and watching how you separate the child from the parent. And quite honestly, once we get the parents out the door, parents, I hate to tell you this, but the kids are fine. So they're making friends, they're part of the whole process, and their 13 years of school, I guess, begins in the Brockton Public Schools. So let's just take a minute and uh, we'll... I believe our enrollment was close to, at this point, 1261 which is pretty stable. So this was the Barrett Russell. This is in the area of the cafeteria, especially for the school committee members. When we went in sometime in August, you saw all of the movement of the file cabinets and the boxes and all of those things. I want to thank our facility department, uh, Deputy Superintendent Thomas, Ken Thompson, uh, Jamie Domestico, for getting out there, for all our teachers, for their hours of unpacking and making sure when opening day came, those kids came into absolutely beautiful classrooms and buildings. So now it transforms to, of course, our little backpacks, our vibrant colors. Our cafeteria. This is an area where we have the corrective and adaptive PE equipment for our students at the Barrett Russell. some of the classrooms and when I was there for again at the different kindergartens for opening day they were already singing they were drawing this is in the uh, bathrooms with the changing area that we had put together that was a concern all of the supplies this is the happy song This also is the transfer of the playground. I believe we have a date of October 3rd with the uh, Kevin Riley family for the rededication of the sway swing and the playground area. This came out beautiful. You see the new fence. It is an area that is separate for the kids. Um, there's privacy for the children and a lot of room for them to enjoy all of their equipment. is your office staff with Principal Camilla. Oh, I'm sorry. This is our uh, Family Connections class at the Adult Learning Center where parents are attending classes along with their children during the day. So you have the children downstairs. I know it and the adults in their class, the parents are upstairs in their Family Connections class. Parents doing homework and wondering about their kids downstairs.
This is the Downey, I believe. This is opening day at the Downey. Davis, Principal Campbell. Going through the lunch line. They can barely reach the, uh, the counter. Support staff. They used to say when we had kindergartners riding buses, they used to come in and you couldn't see them looking out the windows. When they left in June, you actually looked like there were students on the bus. They had grown so much. This was uh, Principal John Kelly uh, at the Downey School, uh, meeting with the parents after the children were all in their classes going over um, the uh, parent involvement, um, how they could uh, interact with the schools and the policies and procedures of the schools. That's it. Very good. So that was opening day throughout the district. We had our full administra administrative team uh, in four south there. And again, it went without a hitch. Uh, kids were picked up on buses. Um, I believe there was, we sent a connect ed message out to parents you know, reminding them that we were adding the kindergartners. We continue to ask drivers to be very careful, like we do every year to start uh, the school year. Um, and so that was opening day. As I said, our enrollment uh, for kindergarten was 1261. And our district-wide enrollment at this point is 16,581. And that's critical as we start to get closer to that October 1st date. Um, I, I did want to invite June uh, Sabre McGuire to come up here. <coughs> I was going to have her go over the enrollment, which I've already shared with you, but I will have her talk um, a little bit because one of the things that we decided, and I want to make sure we continue to talk about it, is we did vote for the rollback starting next year of November 1st for our kindergarten students. So next year we will not have November or December birthdays in our kindergarten, but what I will have. Um, June talk about is the plan for our preschool uh, task force in the district. So just to um, talk a little bit more about kindergarten enrollment, I thought you'd all like to know that our kindergartners are the actually the class of 2030. So if you can picture that date in your mind, I thought you might be interested in hearing that. So our class of 2030 began our six days into school. So think about where you're going to be about 13 years from now. So, um, and again, just talking a little bit more about kindergarten enrollment. Um, some of the areas that we have of concern right now are certainly the Northwest Zone. Uh, the superintendent um, talked about the 1,261 total enrollment, which is about 100 students fewer than we had last year at about this time. But we do still have areas of concern around large class size and especially in the Northwest Zone where we're looking at gen ed classes that are an average of about 29. Um, we also have some real concern around some of our bilingual kindergarten classes. At the George School, we have a class of 28. We have a kindergarten class of 30 at the Baker and one of 28 at the Raymond. And those, again, those are some of our highest kindergarten numbers across the district. And I have to say our principals and teachers did an amazing job, as usual, opening the doors to our youngest students. And um, I know that they continue to do that on a daily basis, but there are some stressors when you have large class sizes, and we certainly can't ignore the fact that we have fewer paraprofessionals to support those classrooms. And so we are looking at that very closely at the district level as we start to in any way identify resources. But at the same time, we recognize that we need to work on putting together our preschool task force and we're hoping to have that task force in place and we'll be starting to meet the first week in November. Um, the task force will hopefully, again, not everybody um, has been selected yet, but we're looking at really having a, a task force that's comprised of multiple stakeholders, including we have a few principals who have expressed a real interest. Um, we're looking at our Office of Learning and Teaching, uh, two of our coordinators who are going to be part of that task force. 
we're going to be asking a couple of teachers, um, certainly a school committee member. So we'll be reaching out to those folks and looking at coordinating calendars so that everybody can really be part of that because once we start to meet, we're really going to have to be meeting on a frequent basis in order to be able to expand our preschool opportunities for our students when we open our doors really in 2018. Um, so we'll be looking at things like a communication plan for the district and making sure our families are well aware that we are starting that pullback starting um, next year. And we're also going to be looking at program development and certainly facility plans. So that task force should be meeting starting uh, the first week in November. Um, in talking about the numbers, June brings up some very large numbers in kindergarten. And we do have other schools that have numbers actually that are acceptable to us. And it, it's sad for me to sit here and say that there are some schools with 18 or 21. And, and I would consider those low numbers when actually those are the numbers that we should have for our kindergarten classes. But um, the concern that we have is with our busing as stressed as it is right now, meaning adding additional buses is very costly. It's money that we don't have. So when people are moving to certain parts of, of the city, we can't send them to another school that might have a seat available. So our Parent Information Center has done an excellent job working with parents, trying to even out these classes. Um, again, this is only one week into kindergarten. There are some folders that are still not completed, but I will be looking at those very large class sizes and the possibility of moving some classes in the district or uh, teachers to support those very large classes. So we're having discussions with the Brockton Education Association. It is ongoing, but I want to at least, we have, like I said, a week into kindergarten. We're still finishing up some of the folders that were incomplete and we'll have a better picture and what we might need to do to support the district. Don't forget also that we have kids move in throughout the year and certainly at all our grade levels, not just our kindergarten classes. I have a question about, um, say, if a student is going to a school where a classroom size is larger, um, you do have room at another school, you know, lower classroom sizes, but if we can't provide the transportation, is it possible to mention to those parents that we do have smaller classroom sizes, but we can't provide transportation? I believe we are, okay. um, you know, having discussions with them. Um, I will make sure that those are the discussions. Certainly, if parents want to transport, yes. you know, they're able to do that. And as I said, we've, we've looked at the cost. I think the buses are like $60,000 to add a bus, and we did everything we could, you know, just to keep the busing as to, you know, the level of funding that we had for the busing for this year, um, or the numbers of buses. So we continue to look at those numbers. Uh, again, if, and, and we'll say that, if parents wanted to change the child into some of the smaller class sizes, we're happy to have those discussions. Great. And I know we were being instrumental in sitting down with parents and you know, trying to move some of those students around. But it was difficult because they were requiring transportation. Thank you. Any other questions? OK, also, um, just to let you know where we are at with callbacks, um, tonight you heard during hearing of visitors uh, Janet Landerholm representing the administrative assistants and she is correct in telling you and I can go through every one of the units it doesn't matter if I'm sitting here talking to you about custodians you know we're doing everything we can maybe every room isn't getting vacuumed every night you know we do not have the staff I believe we're still down 10 custodians and that places a stress on the district um, people are, are working as hard as they can but I think as we continue to go through the year, these are things that we're going to have discussions about. Janet mentions to you those offices where, again, we have reduced, not because there was a reduction in workload, but because it's a reduction in force. And there are some things that are not going to get done that maybe got done in a day or two or even a week or two. That at this point here, when we're doing everything we can for the hours that we're working, people are putting in additional hours, but it is a stress to the district, and I believe we have seven administrative assistants still out. With our paraprofessionals, we have a list uh, in my office of what I'm calling priority uh, callbacks at this point. 
we actually sat after school, got up, and we talked about the numbers of paraprofessionals we need for kindergarten classes, instructional paras, special education paras, bilingual paras. We talked about teachers. When you heard me mention a couple of the classes at North Middle School in social studies uh, in, in the 40s uh, you know, for numbers. When we talk about, we did bring back for compliance an art and I believe a, a health teacher. Um, there's school adjustment counselors that I'm hearing again that the schools are hurting by not having the support that they had during the past year. So when we added all this up, I said to Aldo Petronio, let's take a look at what we got for priority items. It was well over a million dollars. So again, when you talk about it as a whole, we have to be strategic. We're looking to find out because there are things that are not gonna get done and we will have to look. Even in the teaching and learning office, we have administrators that were there last year that are not there this year. We've consolidated and we are continuing to look. It's not something that can happen all at once. We are trying to support our district to make sure that our children get the education they deserve and that we're able to provide customer service to our families and to our students. Um, we also, um, what, what I will tell you, we have 80 teaching positions are just under still out. We have just under 90 paraprofessional positions still out. I mentioned the administrative assistance at seven, 21 MTAs and I believe 10 custodians. But what I will also tell you is as far as people, this is different than eliminated positions. For teachers, there are 27 teachers that have not been recalled that are on our recall list. Those are not the positions we eliminated, but those are teachers that we have available that are still on our recall list, still collecting unemployment to our knowledge at this point. For paraprofessionals, although you see a large number, there are 12 that remain on the recall list that have not gotten other jobs that are still collecting unemployment and that's down from the 94 that we started with when you look back on uh, the reductions back in June. And as far as our MTA goes, although we eliminated 21 positions, we have nobody left on our recall list because of the turnover in that position. But again, still down uh, those 21 positions. So we will uh, be having um, a new budget barometer. I am gonna ask Aldo Petronio to come up here and talk about um, some of the advocacy things that are important for you to hear at this point that he and I are working on because already, and I'm not sure anybody wants to hear this, but much different than years past, we are immediately going to switch from our barometer from FY18 to our barometer for FY19. Now, these are going to be projections, but we'll start to look at the staff that is not back with us We'll start to look at uh, the increases due to uh, bargaining uh, raises, et cetera. So we will look at a number of those things. We can't figure on an inflation rate, but we can start to look at what's happened the past year or over the past couple of years. And we'll start to look at what we're dealing with. So on a couple of notes, one of the things, Aldo, I'm gonna have you talk about is the uh, advocacy going on with the homeless students and the calculations as we get ready for the October 1st enrollment report and also to talk about the economically disadvantaged um, working committee that you have been working on and the recommendations that have been sell, uh, sent to um, interim commissioner Jeff Wolfson. Yes, good evening. Um, as part of our work, our last meeting that we had, we've been meeting either once or twice a month and the group is myself, Revere, Chelsea, a member of the MTA, a member of um, Mass Budget and Finance. Um, there's also a few members that have come in and out from uh, um, other communities. What we're trying to determine is how they can change the formula in order to fix the mistakes that have been made to Brockton, Chelsea Revere, and others as far as counting our low income goes. So um, what we've discovered is that uh, the, the the primary problem is that we all have immigrant students and many of them do not qualify for any state assistance. Therefore, when they run our student database through the state computers, they don't come up in there and therefore they're not, they're not known, they're not being recognized. So one of the things that um, we finally came to the determination that we would submit to the Department of Ed as a request in the, in the next budget, one is just for FY19 and then one is a permanent fix. So what we're requesting is that we currently report any student that's been in this country three years or less. It's the three-year immigrant number, they call it. And what we're saying is any student that's not, that's not directly certified that is three years or less should be counted. 
And the, the proposal we're making is that if you're in decile 10, which is Brockton, which is the poorest of the communities, that 100% of those students who have been here less than three years get counted 100% for us. Decile 9, which is communities, you know, a little better off than Brockton, not bad, they'll get 90% of those students counted towards them. Decile 8, 7, 6, all the way down to, let's say, uh, you know, Milton might be a, a decile one. They'll get 10% of those students counted towards them. And the rationale is that students who arrive here, especially in Brockton, are not coming here and then after a couple of years they're wealthy and, you know, they're out of that category. So the argument is that we want them captured. That's for FY19. For FY20, what we're asking is that we create a new column within the state database for each district and we note the country of origin in there. And we note whether or not they're an immigrant or not an immigrant. And what we're saying is, just because you're an immigrant, after your third year, again, you don't all of a sudden become wealthy. You don't all of a sudden become no longer low income. So we want the same formula, but looking at greater than three years. So your fourth year, your fifth year, you're still counting those students. We're hoping that'll pick up enough um, students to, to kind of offset the, the negative aspects of this whole counting system that we've had. So that's a proposal that's been put forward along with we wanted additional categories within Mass Health. Apparently there's 162 categories in Mass Health that you can be classified under. And for the initial rounds, they used like 60 of those categories. We're asking it to be broadened to pick up a lot more um, uh, students. One is like limited Mass Health, which means you do not qualify for state benefits. But if you show up in an emergency room, they don't turn away a seven-year-old. They take them in. So they, they, they end up getting qualified under a limited mass health. We're asking those students to be logged and identified. So um, th all those categories are in there. We're also asking that any student, any child that's in foster care and any student that is considered homeless. Currently, every district has a homeless um, office and we report our homeless liaison reports who those homeless students are. We'd like all of them automatically counted as part of this count. That should increase our overall low income number of students, which in turn on the current uh, table, we are reimbursed at $4,150 each. So we lost 4,500 kids, $19 million is what we lost. We're now trying to slowly inch our way back up on that list and get them all counted. In all this research that we've done, in meeting with the state officials and discussing these different categories, the homeless one we, we, we questioned. And one of the things I questioned was, who determines that and how is that determined? And it came back that they said they follow the federal guidelines for homeless. Under the federal guidelines, the McKinney-Vento guidelines, unaccompanied youth are considered homeless. Uh, foster care was one of them that's considered homeless. Living in a shelter is homeless and doubled up is homeless. So what doubled up basically is, is someone arrives here from another country or someone is already here from, from this country, they can no longer rent an apartment or pay their bills. They go and they live with a relative or they live with a friend. So the fact that they have moved in with someone because of a financial burden, they're considered doubled up. So our parent information center will now have to go and start as people come in and do their intake, um, note in a category, which category they're under, such as doubled up, and record that in our student database. So once it's recorded in our student database, that doubled up should translate into homeless, which should translate into us being reimbursed. So for the past five days, uh, we've had our parent information center going through a list of 8,000 students, identifying whether or not they're doubled up, whether or not they're considered um, you know, any, any sort of DCF category, any, um, uh, any, whether they're living in a shelter or not, getting them classified and getting that information into our student database. So I'm waiting to hear back from state officials to make sure that we've done it properly and that they will extract that data from us when the time comes. Um, we've already run our entire student database through the state's computers. We've come up with about 8,000 directly certified students. That's not good enough. We had 10,000 last year. Part of it is because we manually input the 400 or so homeless. Now for us, homeless was the kids living in the hotels. We would add those to the system and the state in turn 
would um, would would add in what they considered their um, state you know, state youths that they control. So that's probably where we got to our figure last year. What we're hoping is once we go in and input the rest of our data as to who is uh, doubled up, that we'll hit a figure of greater than 10,000. I'm I'm hoping for 12,000 because if we if we were to pick up 2,000 more students, that's over eight million dollars more of funding probably trigger an audit and they're going to want to come down and see how and why we found all this because they won't be happy but we'll be prepared. Soraya and her team have been documenting everything and we'll have all the, all the files necessary. They're actually calling families right now that we don't have information on to get this information and, and bring it forward and uh, put it in our system. So the, 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 the good side is we could pick up additional money. The, the flip side is this is something that every year must be Reevaluated every year. You must um, somehow re-interview or, 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 or find out from these families if they're still doubled up, if they're still in a shelter, or if they're not. So that piece will work out with the Department of Ed um, when we get to that point to find out: Are we allowed to just send a letter asking them? Are we allowed to just interview the student? But we'll get to that piece. But at least for this October one, um, they're working. As a matter of fact, they're probably still working right now going through every student we have to find out who really technically, according to the federal guidelines, is low income. So um, there the, the could be some additional money for next year. It has to be in the database before we transmit. And talking okay. to Boo Lim and Deb Leach, although October 1 is the number, they really transmit about a week later or even sometimes up to two weeks later if they need more time. So what's important is, was the student here at our school by October 1? Right. So as long as the date of entry into the school system is prior to that and they haven't transmitted the data, we're, we're fine. And we're manually entering all of these right now. That data field will be entered with September 6th because that's when these students arrived and came here. So okay. um, that's, that's a good question and that, that's what we're keeping an eye on. All right. Lisa? Thank you. When we're looking for our students that may be doubled up, are we looking at students who perhaps haven't sent in as proof of residency um, a lease or utility bills? Are we able to look at all of them? That's exactly where the information comes from. When, when they first come to the Parent Information Center and they're interviewed, they're asked for proof of residency. When they don't have a lot of proof of residency, the question basically comes out, who you're living with and why don't you have it? And that's when the information is written down. I'm living with my aunt. That's where it comes down that they're doubled up. Okay. And so that's, um, that's the documentation that we have. So um, again, I don't know at some point if the state's going to say they want more documentation, but how much more can you get if there is no paper to follow it? You know, if we're also at the same time, um, I have to give Soraya credit on this one. With students that we couldn't find and we couldn't get hold of, she took the address that was listed, went on the city's assessor's database to look up the owner of the house. If the owner of the house had a different name than the person living there, then at least we knew that they probably were. If the names matched, then they were a homeowner, they weren't homeless. So we were able to eliminate those from the list. So they've been doing that at the same time they're calling people. Great, and I'm sorry, one other question. Are we not receiving full funding for students in foster care? Well, we receive our funding, okay. and those students in foster care, we have to, in the past, manually list okay. those students. The way this process worked before, I'll just do it real quick. Everything came through school lunch before. When there was lunch applications, all low-income information came through school lunch. So school lunch would maintain its own database. That was our Horizon database system. That's what we reported to the state. So every child did a lunch application. They were noted as whether they were free, reduced, or paid. And that's what the Department of Ed took. When they switched off this system, they no longer look at those forms. They just went to the direct cert, which was their database with our kids. So this piece now is, this homeless piece is one that, um, that is manual. And that's the piece that we're, they weren't too forthcoming with telling us this, but we kind of pulled it out of them. Um, and, and they basically said we follow McKinney Vento and so I pulled out the laws and read through the laws of McKinney Vento and I found that the, the, there were these categories that our kids are in. So now we're making sure we get them properly classified in our system. And now I'm waiting for a call back from the state 
to make sure that if they're supposed to be in column 19 and we have them in column 20, make sure they're in the right column so that they pick them up. Um, I'm also going to ask um, Dr. Cancel to come up and help me out. I'm sorry I'm struggling. I'm not sure what I'm choking on. I think it's sawdust uh, coming from uh, our drama area. So uh, last Friday, uh, we had a conference call with Paul Revel, who is the former Secretary of Education, and more importantly, was an architect of uh, ed reform back in the early 90s. So when we talk about the McDuffie and the Hancock case, he was very instrumental in understanding the process, of being part of the process. So we probably spoke to him for about 45 minutes to an hour this past Friday. <clears throat> the one thing he talked about was what he called the grand bargain. So if you look back in the 90s, the grand bargain was that we would get this money under ed reform and we would expect that students would graduate with a high stakes testing proving to us that they had received an education that was worthy of a diploma, et cetera, and meeting high standards. And when you talk about Massachusetts, we are number one in the nation because of all of that effort, all of the money infused into districts. So in talking, again, about a way to go, um, and again, we're going to continue along our line with an equity and education lawsuit, but there were a number of things that he brought to our attention that are worthwhile for us to consider. So I'm going to talk about a couple of things, Ethan. I'm not sure if there are things that you want to add. Ethan, you worked or, with Paul Revel previously, and I thank you for setting up that phone call. Um, and I will remind you, you heard me talk about when Aldo and I were in the State House in July talking before that Committee for House Bill 223, which was pushing forward the Foundation Budget Review Commission recommendations, which talked about special education, bilingual, children living in poverty and things that they felt was a broken system as to how they fund education. Paul Revel was the first person that got up to speak, and one of the things he said to the committee was what you have done with this report, and not moving forward with it, and the governor's office, was that you are giving a district ammunition to bring an equity and education lawsuit. He spoke about us looking at the Hancock case, which was after the McDuffie case. It was trying to reopen the McDuffie case, and at the time, the courts did not close the door, but they weren't willing to move forward. The state was making their uh, contribution. And so, again, he mentioned, you know, looking at the Hancock to see with our attorneys if there's anything that we could do to reopen that case. The other thing he talked about was he wanted us to look at creating a strong coalition with other urbans, and he talked about from Pittsfield, he said not just the communities that we have in common with when you hear about the Chelsea's and the Revere's and the Everett's, and of course Boston is its own you know, uh, entity in itself, it's so large, but he talked about getting all of the urbans together, developing a strong coalition with our legislative delegation. So the legislative delegation from Pittsfield and Brockton and Salem and Lynn and Worcester and Springfield, and all the different groups so that we are all on the same page as far as moving forward with this equity and education lawsuit. I think that is doable. You know that I serve on the urban superintendent um, network leadership as far as being one of the co-chairs. We plan the meetings. I actually have a conference call for planning our October meeting. I am going to talk about, I've been talking about the equity in education. Some were hesitant to jump on right now. They were looking at some things happening with the state budget coming forward, which benefited their districts in a way that it did not benefit ours. So I think people are ready to now start to have the discussion. And I will talk about possibly one of our Friday urban superintendent meetings, inviting our legislative groups, or we go to them. So in coming up with a time where we actually sit down with all our legislators from every one of the urban districts and start to develop a strong coalition. It doesn't mean we wait about the <coughs> equity and education lawsuit, but that was a good suggestion. The other thing that uh, Paul Revel talked about was businesses, universities, uh, nonprofits. They all came on board back then in the early 90s because there was something in it for them. For businesses, it was an educated workforce. For nonprofits, this is the kind of work that they do, supporting fairness and equity for our students. So as I said, the conversation was, um, I don't want to say eye-opening, but it made us kind of take a step back and it's, 
it's a little bit more than filing an equity and education lawsuit. So we will um, you know, start to look at some of those areas. Yeah, I'm not sure, Ethan, if there's something that you want to add to that or? No, I mean, you, you really got it. The, the <clears throat> challenge is going to be to try to find something that unifies these different groups. And that was why um, you know, Paul pointed to Kathy's position in leadership as an urban superintendent um, in the urban superintendent network and how important it is to have the local politicians, meaning city and school committees from all those different urbans, so from Pittsfield and all that, working with their legislators to form that um, and strengthen the, the coalition or caucus within the legislature. But it really is going to be a, uh, it needs to be a statewide, well-coordinated, well-thought-out um, campaign. I'm wondering if you have your upcoming um, meeting in November with your um, MASS, your Mass Association of School Superintendents, your MASC, Mass Association of School Committees uh, down in Hyannis. And I'm wondering if there might be an opportunity you know, for us maybe send a team there and really engage with other school committees from the other districts, invite every one of the urban districts, you know, that would be present and really start having a dialogue. So that's coming up within a month or so. We would have to probably meet and talk to uh, Glenn Kucher and Tom Scott about, you know, having a room there where we can actually maybe invite people and start to have a discussion. So I have my conference call this week. I will bring it up with my group and uh, Tom Scott who oversees MASS, and I'm not sure if one of you will volunteer to, to take the lead with uh, MASC. Want to take the lead there, so you and I will have a conversation and maybe see if we can come up with a time when we're down the Cape to at least start that dialogue and forming a coalition of school <coughs> committees and s the superintendents before we invite in our other elected officials. Okay, All right, thank you, Ethan. Um, I'm also, in talking about this, I do want to mention um, a letter that Representative Claire Cronin uh, did send to <coughs> Governor Baker. I'm not sure if uh, it was sent to you. I believe we just got it out recently. And I do want to mention to everybody publicly that I feel very strongly and support Representative Cronin. When we were there and the charter vote was being taken, and don't forget we were there for two years. You know, the previous year there was a lot of dialogue. Um, there was deference giving to our uh, elected officials who came, who spoke uh, against uh, the charter for our particular district. And one of the things that did happen when we were there in February of, uh, I believe, 2016, um, Representative Cronin came and you had Representative Cassidy there, Representative Dubois, and she, <clears throat> excuse me, she asked for a little bit of extra time, I believe it was three minutes that you could actually speak and give your testimony. And she was told that no, she really would not be able to do that. She would have to just use her three minutes. And I've seen much more deference given to our elected officials who are very busy and again are representing a lot of people and should be allowed, you know, if they have testimony that they've worked on and they've worked on it together, rather than have three people come up for nine minutes, you have somebody come up and if they go a little over three minutes, that should be acceptable. So Chair uh, Paul Sagan at the time told her that was not going to be possible. The vote was taken. Um, I don't think we felt it was a, a you know, level playing field at the time. Representative Cronin expressed that in her letter. Uh, those of you uh, that have watched the process know that last year you had the charter question come up. And although there's advocacy on both sides, and that I will admit, people feel strongly for charters and supporting increasing the seat capacity, other people you know, are not supporting that. And the vote was very clear last year. I can't remember the exact percentage, but I want to say the vote went down to increase the uh, seat capacity by, what, 62% against increasing it? I mean, it was a large number. And the reason uh, that I bring that up is what came out in the past um, few months, and actually, uh, actually just recently, but a number of months ago, it was stated that $100,000 was given by uh, Chairman uh, Paul Sagan, who chairs the Board of Education, and makes these decisions is instrumental in leading this group. And now another $500,000 donation that was funneled, you know, uh, not with transparency to another group. So Representative Cronin has asked for his resignation from the Board of Education, and I fully support her. I also um, 
want to uh, invite Dr. Tarasi to come up here. I think he can help me because I am struggling here a little bit, Dr. Tarasi. So we were a district that was picked, I believe we're one of nine districts for what we call the Excel, uh, Excellence Through Social Emotional Learning. Um, and I think again, um, it's important for Bro uh, Brockton to be a part of this network, which clearly uh, is looking at um, possibly accountability with social and emotional standards. So Dr. Trassi, can you tell us a little bit about the- Well, so very quickly, the, the Rennie Center for <coughs> Research and Policy, along with Teachers 21 and an organization called Transform, um, th those three uh, agencies are working together, um, most likely in conjunction with the State Department of Education, in order to promote the concept of, and to begin to understand the concept of how social emotional learning works in schools. Um, Brockton uh, is one of nine districts that was selected by the state to be part of this Excel network. And so over the course of the year, we'll engage in uh, working with the Rennie Center. And I think that will, it will benefit Brockton in a couple of ways. First of all, because it will help us to promote our own concept of trauma-sensitive schools and social-emotional learning. And equally important, it will position us well to inform statewide policy because the Rennie Center will clearly be called upon by <coughs> DESE uh, to inform their policy. And, and we want to make sure that um, they, they get this right as they turn this into policy recommendations and mandates. So we're kind of excited about that. Thank you, Dr. Tarasi. Um, a couple of other things that are important to bring up. Um, we did talk about uh, to, in the previous meeting the, this is, <clears throat> excuse me, the Municipal Schools Facility Study and Master Plan. So this is something we've talked about certainly for my <clears throat> four years uh, as superintendent. So this is a draft. We have a lot of homework in reviewing this document, but we're very excited. Um, I believe the next portion of this will actually be working um, with our local community to talk about <coughs> what our schools look like in 10 years, what do they look like in 20 years. So this is important for ed any community to do planning, it positions you well for uh, mass school building assistance funding or anything that, um, again, would support our buildings and the support of increasing uh, opportunities for our kids with updated buildings, technology, um, the kinds of structures that we want. So again, I was just given this last week. I have started to read it, and we will certainly, uh, it is a draft copy. The other thing that just came out um, with the uh, US, um, <clears throat> excuse me, with the United States Department of Education, they have to approve our new Under Every Student Succeeds Act. So before you had no child <coughs> left behind. So under ESSA, our plan was uh, submitted as a state in April of 2017. It has been approved by uh, Secretary, U.S. Secretary of Education, Betsy DeVos. Um, it was uh, given high marks, and this is again going to be our accountability standards, we're just really unpacking it and reviewing it. We just received it. As we do that, I will do a presentation with the school committee when we look at our accountability. We'll also talk about ESSA going forward, and I believe this is through uh, November 30th of 2019. This will uh, inform our accountability. Um, and I want to close with a couple of things uh, of note. We are going to be uh, working with our district. We talked about it opening day with a social justice committee. Uh, Sharon Wolder will be heading up that committee in the district. It is about teaching tolerance. I don't think it can come at a better time. So we're talking about our youngest students to our older students, developing curriculum, providing opportunities, making sure our teachers are comfortable with this highly charged atmosphere of addressing some of the things that are coming before us, whether we're looking at a football game on TV now. So this conversation is conversation that we as educational leaders need to start to have <clears throat> in our classroom and understanding some of the feelings that are going on. So we are putting together, um, as I said, a social justice uh, curriculum committee that will be working to support additional courses from the littlest students, certainly to our older students. And the other thing I want to call out is we've got uh, staff Appreciation, Teacher and Staff Appreciation Night on October 13th. It's a Friday evening. I hope we have a better night than we had this past Friday, which I don't know how many of you were actually there. You were there. I, I don't, I don't want to say I was that brave, <clears throat> but they did hold the games throughout, not just Brockton, but throughout the state. They held games. I think we thought it was going to let up 
let up and it just continued to really pour all night. So hopefully on the 13th, we have a much better <coughs> night. We're planning a lot of fun activities for our teachers and our staff. Um, there's going to be good food, um, entertainment. There are going to be raffles. I know there's going to be an alumni table. So we do have a committee uh, getting together to start to get word out to everybody. We really would like the community to come together, not only to support our wonderful athletes, but to come out and, and make this uh, uh, certainly a wonderful evening. And I know this Friday, I believe I talked to athletic director uh, Kevin Carroll, and our football team is actually at Harvard. They're playing BC. I think their field is being uh, renovated at BC. I don't think their field is actually looked at today when I drove by. There's a lot of construction in UMass. Okay. UMass is a <clears throat> hole in the ground right now. Yeah, it is. <laughs> I've seen the equipment. So at this point here, it is Friday evening. The game is on the grounds of Harvard. There's lots of parking. Beautiful um, It's a great stadium. There's great places to go afterwards. So if people, again, come out and support all our teams. Uh, last night I went out and I'm trying to get to every one of at least the varsity games. I was at the girls' field hockey. Um, so it was a beautiful night to be out. The one thing that we had a conversation about is we have Marciano Stadium and we talked about the turf and what a wonderful field it is. And it, again, it's probably when we start to talk about facilities and look at going forward, we definitely need additional fields and probably turf fields in the years to come. I know this isn't something you know, on our uh, front burner right now, but again, when you look at the student athletes and sharing the fields, and it was great to be able to see not just our football team using the field, but also our soccer, and not just the boys, but also our girl teams are also having that opportunity. And I want to mention also, I know I caught it on TV last night. I have to get over there. I see Principal Mary Beth O'Brien out in the audience. So the Gilmore School recently had a collaboration with the YMCA United Way, where the YMCA with Erin Spaulding brought staff to the Gilmore. They painted beautiful things in the playground for the kids to play with, what's it called, Foursquare or Hopscotch or all kinds of things for playground activities. They spent hours at the school. So those kinds of things are just so appreciated. Our students feel good. I think they even painted the logo on the cement outside. So we will get a big thank you out to the Y and the United Way. And again, I want to thank everybody for coming together and from the very small things to the very large things that are making a difference uh, for our schools. And that's my report for tonight. <clears throat> One thing. I see Kelly Jones out in the audience. I'm going to invite her to come down. Kelly, why weren't you waving at me? <laughs> so we have other good news. And Kelly came running into the office on Friday. And she said to me with a big smile, I have good news. And we're not often getting good news. So Kelly, I was thrilled uh, to hear about this new grant. And uh, right. Laurie. Back in April, the federal government released an RFP request for proposals for the National Profe Professional Development Grant for English Language Learners. Um, it is a, a, a national request, and we had in institutions of higher education and departments of education submitting their proposals. We were approached by Lesley University um, as the sole district partner in a proposal that they wanted to offer given our institutional capacity locally as well as the, um, the high regard that the state has for its education of English learners. And I'm happy to say that uh, Lesley University was one of two uh, institutions of higher education in Massachusetts to receive this grant. Um, there were 22 nationwide uh, in Massachusetts, Framingham State and Lesley University were awarded their proposals. Their um, proposal is for $2.7 million over five years. Um, and we crafted something that's really going to align mm -hmm. with the strategic plan of the district, in particular um, academic excellence for all, as well as community engagement. What this proposal is doing is it's providing free tuition for up to 14 Brockton educators a year to take a, to obtain a uh, certificate in English learner teaching and parent engagement. So there will be up to 70 teachers receiving 12 credits free from Lesley University with Lesley <coughs> University staff around the issues of English learner education and uh, parent engagement. 
Um, the, the, the Brockton kind of um, component, the value is we don't get any, any money, you know, in, we get it in kind from mm -hmm. Leslie University. So the, the direct contribution to Brockton personnel is $251,509 per year for five years, and that's $1.257 million that we are going to get. It's going to um, support the high rigor and education that we already provide. It's also going to address some of our compliance requirements, mm -hmm. and it, uh, there is a, a parent education component as well, which relates to prong three of the strategic plan. Partnering with the Cape Verdean Association, the Leslie University is going to provide ESL classes um, at the Cape Verdean Association for teachers for five years, um, and they're going to develop teacher, uh, parent leaders. Right. So it's not just English as a second language classes, but it's also how do we, how do we grow our teachers, our, our parents to become leaders within the district. You want to add anything, Lori? Sure. Um, I think one of the, the major aspects that this is really exciting for us, too, is as people um, are probably aware, we have a huge wait list for um, ESL mm -hmm. services at the Adult Learning Center. Uh, we typically run um, approximately 1,200 um, you know, uh, adults um, waiting uh, to come through the door. So this is a wonderful exposure for some of those parents who are on, on the wait list that they'll be able to receive some of those services. Um, we're also um, in another vein of, of you know, working with um, our English language learners. We're looking at also in a partnership with Bridgewater, there's an exciting um, opportunity for partnering with um, MTEL preps. So for having some of our um, bilingual paras um, who are maybe having struggles with passing the MTEL test or MTAs or even some of our long-term substitutes, <clears throat> but excuse me, in working with them since um, January, um, we've been able to design a proposal where they'll actually um, do a, uh, a course specifically designed to help um, English language learners staff be able to be better prepared to pass the MTEL. Um, and then on the um, other side um, to bring forward with regards to the uh, parent engagement um, activities as well, um, we had lost our um, ESL instructor through the, for the community schools component, um, and thankfully we now have found another one who is willing to do the ESL courses, um, and also her husband, who is a lawyer, um, has also been um, uh, interested in doing a citizenship class to, to prepare parents to become um, citizens and take the test. So lots of good things um, occurring, so some really great partnerships and, and strong connections um, between um, institutes of higher ed um, and the Brockton school system. And Laurie, thank you again for always being available to support grant writing with our oh, absolutely. district directors in the district and uh, to Karen Watts also, and they have just been a terrific team. Mm -hmm. Kind of going above and beyond. <laughs> That's what they need to do. Thank you. Any questions? Is it? Now I think I'm done. You sure not. I thought that was great news. I just. It's great, absolutely. Okay, <clears throat> how about uh, under new business? We need to elect a. Uh... I have an item to refer to subcommittee. Oh, did I go by that? He did. We usually don't have. I'm one. sorry. Items to refer to subcommittee. Go ahead, Brad. I have an item regarding BEA uh, administrators that I'd like to refer to subcommittee, and a policy. Um, examination for the Safety, Security, and Transportation Committee. Uh, I'd like to refer to subcommittee as well. Okay, so the first one is for which subcommittee? Policy? Yes. So you're looking for a policy subcommittee and also a safety and transportation. Mm -hmm. So policy is you, Tom. How about safety and transportation? Is that Sully? Yeah. Who's chair of that? So do you guys want to coordinate with Wander on dates and get out to everybody by email? Is that okay? Okay. And the other uh, subcommittee we need to bring together is a finance subcommittee. We have some changes uh, in the uh, calculations for the vouchers and the contracted slots with um, our early childhood, and that affects our um, Smart Start Extended Day program. 
So we'd like to uh, do that, I believe, next Tuesday evening we were looking for for finance because of a timeline that we're on. How, uh, how much time do you think that is? is that, that should be short. There'll just be a presentation on the increases. It's a slight increase, <clears throat> but it is something that has yeah. to come before the school committee so can be approved. Tom, possibly finance and policy can be done at the same time. Committees of the whole, maybe you can knock them out the same night. Okay. okay. All right. So the, the chairs of those subcommittees will coordinate with uh, Wander and the superintendent's office to get those scheduled and out to everybody by email. Good. Any other items for subcommittee? Three subcommittees is enough for one night. Now on to new business. Um, election of official voting delegate to the MASC annual business meeting. to be the delegate that's fine if not that's fine too okay anyone else like to be nominated to be the delegate oh, <laughs> I think we have to nominate quick before he changes his mind I think we have to nominate an, <laughs> an alternate too I think there's an alternate that they want as well right someone else like to be the alternate just in case at the last minute What's the uh, November 1st 2nd and 3rd I think yeah it's the first week in November so it's before the election what, what day is the election Seventh. Seventh. So now I have to backtrack. Seven, sixth, fifth, fourth, third, first, second. You pulling it up? I was on board. I'll be the one. Good. Great. Okay. Right. Do you have the dates there? Uh, I thought you were pulling it up in a calendar. <coughs> Actually, it starts Wednesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, right? Yeah, one, two, and three. Saturday. Okay. So everyone is uh, in agreement with Tom as the delegate and uh, Mr. Sullivan as the alternate? Okay. I'll take that as a consensus. We'll call that an election. How about any other items under new business? No? Tim? I just had one other question. Three open houses tonight. And all the teachers and the staff that I talked to. Is that to, why you were late, Tim? Yes, it is no, why. No. I had three in one night. <laughs> <laughs> well, anyway, all the teachers and the staff that I talked to are glad they're working. But they are short. The, uh, the George School is a 32 student kindergarten, which they thought was real high. Uh, they need four parents. The Angela was missing, missing teachers. They're combining the fourth and fifth grade. It makes it a real large class. Same teacher, the fourth and fifth grade. And they all need Paris. They're bilingual Paris and the ESL Paris. I just wanted to mention that up. And the, uh, also for the Angelo, they're sharing an adjustment counselor. And they're really short. They'd like to have a whole one. I know that's a finance issue, but I just wanted to bring it up. Well, I, I also want to thank all of you because I know that you're out there supporting the schools, having conversations as we are with principals and staff. I want you to keep those lines of communication open. Tim, I know you were visiting schools. I know Mark D'Agostino has been out visiting schools. I, I know some people work full-time jobs and during the day. Yeah, but you know, it is important. I know it's important for them to see you and the support that you offer and bring those you know, discussions here to the table. So we're very much aware of it. Um, we are working as hard as we can to identify funding and at the same time, I think it's critical for you to look at where we're at when we project the budget for next year. So you know, we're doing everything we can with advocacy, with looking at October 1st, being critical as far as getting numbers in that make a difference for us. At the same time, you hear us. You know, we're having discussions about, it's not just discussions, we're looking strategically at the equity and education lawsuit. We're talking about you know, things uh, that our city can do along with the state. So we, uh, we do appreciate you know, the, the feedback and I do again encourage you to keep the lines of communication open. So Lieutenant, maybe <clears throat> just as a suggestion down the road, maybe the open houses could be not scheduled on the same night as the school committee meeting yeah. so all the members could go visit the schools. Yeah. You know, I apologize, I think what happened to us was when the primary was last week, we already had the open houses scheduled, 
And what happened was we didn't, uh, we weren't able to, I forget whatever happened, but the Wednesday we had a member or two that couldn't make it last Wednesday. And we went to this Tuesday where we usually have Tuesdays put aside. So I do apologize. I do think it's important for all of you to be out, you know, to the open houses. And like I said, being visible and hearing, you know, what the parents' uh, concerns are. So we will be more careful next year if that happens. Tim, I think we all share your concern around Paris. I think Paris are at the top of everybody's priority list. All right. If there's nothing else on the new business, uh, we'll entertain a motion. Motion made, properly seconded. All in favor? This meeting is officially adjourned. Thank you. <laughs>